previous patients here uh, about tropical hummingbirds in South America and Central America, and um, a split performance with John Sterling and Steve Hampton about trips to uh, Nome, Alaska. Um, and some of people present here were also part of. Um, um, in January 2018 and again in December of 2022, okay. kind of two, two week voyages to the Falkland Islands uh, organized by Greg Downing, with whom I've traveled before in various parts. Um, and I just wanted to show you the map in case people haven't recently been on a cruise ship <laughs> and uh, seen it in person. So you fly from Sacramento to Dallas or Atlanta, depending on the airline, and then continue on to Santiago, Chile, and typically overnight there, and then catch the only flight per week that goes to the Falkland Islands. If you miss it, you have to wait another week. Um, it flies down to Punta Arena, at the southern tip of Chile, and then after a short intermission over to the Falklands, which are about 300, 350 miles from the <clears throat> east coast of South America. Um, okay. Okay. We'll have to work out the signals of the dancing here. Just do the, the, the arrows. I know, I'm trying to do the arrows. Are you in final or preview? Yeah. Ryan knows what he's doing. Okay. There we go. Mm -hmm. So, and you're the clicker, right? I'm clicker. Here's so the here are the Falkland Islands, okay. uh, the uh, capital of uh, a big village of 3,000 people is on the east end of it. So you fly in from Punta Arenas, you land at the military base, um, Mount St um, Pleasant, uh, that the British have established after the Falkland War of 82, and then transferred to Stanley. After we <clears throat> have settled in, in a very nice hotel, uh, in Malvina House, uh, we are taking the next day to uh, <clears throat> a point north, you see Volunteer Point, which involves a trip first on a paved road, then on a gravel road, and the last lake, totally cross-country, trackless, roadless area. Um, but for local drivers know what they're doing, depending on the weather. Sometimes it can be quite boggy. During the first trip, one of the vehicles sank down to his axles, we needed to hold out the other vehicle. And the second voyage that Joanne was in the <clears throat> uh, it was pretty dry and uneventful. Okay. Uh, before we get to volunteer, on the volunteer point, driver, uh, I want to explain how we got around on the islands, since there are a lot of islands uh, that make up the archipelago archipelago of the uh, Falklands. We fly in these islands. There are two propeller um, airplanes that are capable of um, fairly rough terrain. Uh, we can have about seven people in there. If the seven person sits in the co-pilot <laughs> seat, as Joanne did and I did and some other, which makes for a good place to take photos, okay? Here you see a plane taken off from the Sea Lion Island. And um, okay. And I wanted to show you that these islands that on the ground were pretty plain. They're fairly uh, low level. The highest elevations are close to 3,000 feet, 1,000 meters, 700 meters actually is one of the highest peaks. But once you fly over it, it becomes quite different and very beautiful. You see that the ocean is crystal clear there. The beach is a white sand, and there is nobody there in most places. Almost all the inhabitants live in Stanley, only on small settlements. Well, you have farms that farm sheep, <laughs> and 
you might see a little road here or there, but otherwise it is completely trackless. Keep going to them. You see the beautiful beach, the color of the ocean, um, the land forms. <laughs> One of my favorite images. Some people have referred to it as the Fiji of the Antarctic. <laughs> White sand beaches, crystal clear water. There's absolutely no garbage or flotsam on the beaches. They're just absolutely pristine. And, um, Maybe some kelp. <laughs> Here we are flying back from our last island, Rika Island, back to Stanley over the open ocean. And even there, you find large kelp beds and beautiful colors turquoise, blue, and whatever other colors there might be. Okay, go through that. Continue. After driving through, um, the roadless area, we come to this amazing beach at Volunteer Point, <coughs> which people who visit the Falklands like to go to because it has the largest king penguin colony on the island, several hundred. Uh, we arrived there, there was no competition. There were just the seven people of us who had the whole place to ourselves, walking around wherever we wanted to. Although they put a uh, ropes for the cruise ship folks when they come to keep them contained in certain areas. Our small group could go wherever we wanted to. It's quite wonderful. As you could see at low tide, a very broad beach is exposed on white sand. And there's a little group of king penguins, <laughs> a Magellanic penguin walking out into the ocean. Okay. And after a while, more king penguins were assembling on the beach. But not really, can we go back? Um, daring to go into the water. If you look in the distance in the water, you see those black points above them. And that's the sea lion that is shadowing them. Whenever they walk this way, they swim that way. Whenever they walk that way, they will follow. And on two occasions, it came out of the water and pursued a king penguin, once getting very close to catching it, but then inexplicably turning around and returning to the water. <laughs> Predation by uh, sea lions of especially king penguins is not that unusual because king penguins cannot really move very quickly. They walk very elegantly, but when it comes to running, they're not very good. <laughs> the other penguin species are quite more nimble. So the prime uh, victim of the sea lions among the penguins are the king penguins, okay? Um, after a while, more king penguins came walking from their colony, which is about a half a mile uphill to the beach. And as you can see, the wind was blowing as almost always in the island, <laughs> and almost obscuring the feet of these penguins. You can see on the right the sand. Okay, here a closer picture. Uh, always very photogenic with their amazing colors and patterns around their head and upper chest. Okay. okay. Then after a while, even more of them showed up. Uh, they were sort of bunching up on the beach because nobody dared to go in the water. <laughs> and uh, was walking past us. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful procession. And here the kind of photo that almost everybody takes because he can relatively close to the penguins, and it's tempting just to take a shot of the head and the upper body, highlighting the incredibly beautiful colors and the gradation from red to orange to yellow, and the gray back that complements those colors really well. Okay. 
Maybe you see them from the back. That was on the trip, my first trip in uh, January 18. Here, the whole group walks into the ocean uh, to go feed. Then uh, we walked up to the colony, and uh, it's always very tempting to take a picture of this of the mass of king penguins standing very close together <clears throat> and seeing. The, the patterns of so, okay. another shot. So in these colonies, you find reproduction, so to speak, at all stages. On the one hand, you have penguins that are with eggs. I was going to say stand on the eggs, but they actually neither sit nor stand on the eggs. Uh, they have the eggs, single egg. And, uh, you also find uh, chicks that have hatched recently, and you find juniors that are in various stages of, of molting, because it takes about 16 months for a chick to uh, advance from being hatched to actually enter the ocean. So the parents feed the chick for a very long time. So you can have some parents with eggs and other parents still tending to offspring from the, the year before. Okay, here you can see uh, one of the penguins standing with its egg on the feet, quite impressive. Uh, the bloody part of it, I don't know, it might be from some food actually, the egg was not broken. Uh, and the egg is visible here because the penguin is in the process of churning the egg, which birds with a nest typically do with their bill, as you may have observed, but they can't do it here. So they just turn like this, and as they turn, the egg rolls on their feet and gets turned in that way. So this penguin was just in the process of doing it. Uh, when they are ready to um, resume incubation, apron-like layer of fat rolls over the egg, a brooding pouch, they call it, and covers the egg completely and keeps it warm as of the feet, which are, of course, more important in areas like South Georgia Island in the Antarctic, because the ground is very cold, they need to protect the egg from the ground. So instead of having a nice upholstered bed, they use their feet to uh, uh, provide that uh, insulation. Um, yeah, some of the the juniors uh, that still have <clears throat> uh, this almost fur-like down that covers them. You can see the wind is blowing. You look at the back of this uh, fellow who uh, seems to be daydreaming. Okay, and here one in a different stage that has lost most of the down. Or you might almost call it fur, <laughs> the one in the bird, and is approaching the adult plumage. Then it takes additional time to, to develop the markings and the colors and so on. Okay. <laughs> Besides king penguins, there's also a fairly substantial colony of Magellanic penguins that uh, uh, dig burrows for their nests, uh, which makes them much more resistant to uh, predation. Um, and uh, for that reason, as you can see in the background, they sometimes look a little dirty because they're down in the, in the dirt and only when they come back out of the water are they re looking respectable, okay? <laughs> Here is another group of you know, typical um, situation where a number of Magellanic uh, penguins come around often in a sort of a circle and start vocalizing, you can't really call it singing because the sound they produce has an uncanny resemblance to a braying donkey. Mm -hmm. And it's a sound that you hear everywhere on the islands. Um, they seem to be in the mood at almost all times of the day. Okay. <laughs> Here's one that has cleaned up a little bit coming out of the ocean on bombs near the beach. Uh, here you see one at its burrow with a chick that's already fairly large and therefore can come out and be less 
subject to be attacked by a skua or a giant petrel or a caracara, which are the main predators of penguin chicks. And then there is a small population of uh, Gentoo penguins, very photogenic, very elegant, uh, whom we will meet in much larger numbers on the other islands. Walking along the beach, I came across this scene during my first visit. And only of it in retrospect did I realize that this was probably a, a penguin kill by a sea lion. And the giant petrel, southern giant, giant petrel here, and the kelp gull were just cleaning, cleaning up the remainder of, of that kill. And that the sea lion had already taken most of the meat. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Magellanic oyster catchers were pretty much on every beach that we visited. Um, we'll see them again. Uh, as were these Falkland flightless steamer ducks. You know, these are pretty hefty ducks that are unable to fly anymore because their wings are really, really small. They live on the beach. They feed in the shallow water of the ocean close to the beach uh, by diving for crustaceans and plant material. This is a male identifiable by the orange bill. The female has a dark gray bill. Okay, so after uh, spending a whole wonderful day on the beach of Volunteer Point, we got back to Stanley, hopped into one of the little red airplanes uh, after we got weighed with our luggage, but the results were kept confidential. <laughs> <laughs> and we were charged for overweight <laughs> of luggage, of course. And, uh, <laughs> Funny how people were kind of concerned how this was going to happen this way. How poor people were quite uh, wonderful. Uh, here, so we flew from Stanley to Sea Lion Island, which was the southernmost island on the map I showed you at the beginning. Uh, in other words, the coldest island, you know, pointing towards Antarctic. Uh, and Close to the quite wonderful guest house uh, was a large uh, colony of gentoo penguins. I should mention that Sea Lion Island is a particularly wonderful island because it's now completely devoted to wildlife conservation. Uh, in other words, there are no sheep uh, grazing on this island, and the native grass is all coming back, and there are vast ex extents of tussock grass that you see here, which forms big clumps and columns, and is often over six feet tall, so much so that shorter people might get lost in it. Uh, <laughs> um, as our group leader reported in the previous uh, trip to the group, a shorter woman uh, got lost and panicked and had to be rescued out of the ocean with all the uh, Classic grass, although it would never be very far from the ocean if you go lost. <laughs> okay. Um, so on um, Sea Lion Island, um, where everything was within walkable distance, we would just spread out sometimes as a group, sometimes or most of the time by ourselves, which was part of the pleasure of being there. You know, have this wonderful uh, natural environment, and it's all yours. You know, there's nobody else there. And the um, gentle penguins uh, for their nest have just a small depression in the ground and they assemble some nesting material around the edge uh, here with a small chick. Maybe often they have two chicks, maybe one had already been pulled out by squaws uh, or other predators, which is very common and can be observed almost every day. Okay. Well, if there's no plant material close by to uh, show the perimeter of the nest, they make a nest out of rocks, you know, collect pebbles or little rocks. Uh, they haven't completely forgotten their obligation to have some plant material. And you can see a little <laughs> package over here over at the top uh, showing the hybrid nature of this nest. <laughs> Mostly rocks, but some plants, okay? 
So this is one of these large expanses of tussock grass, which used to cover most of the islands before people arrived uh, and brought cattle and sheep, um, which decimated the uh, tussock grass stands. But some effort is being made in places even where there are sheep to fence off certain areas and restore the remaining sections to uh, what it used to be in the old days. It's a great wildlife habitat. During the whaling days, whalers would release pigs into these stands and to have food and they were reproducing and they had trouble finding the pigs. They would just set the whole place on fire to drive the pigs out. <laughs> the story of the exploitation of the natural resources during the early days was horrific. They crushed hundreds of thousands of pelicans here fired the ovens for their melting pots for the whale blubber with penguins. They were like firewood because wow. there's no wood down there anywhere, nothing to burn except peat. And peat will not be hot enough to, to boil the blubber of whales. So seals, sea lions, and penguins were slaughtered in incredible numbers. Well, fortunately, the days are over and uh, things are beginning to recover. and. Rather than celebrate the area, more and more people are coming down there to see it. Okay, next. Here, another view of uh, what part of the guest house where you can see how the grasses are coming down, and there's a little inland pond sea surrounded by many, many geese, which were also present in all the islands. Okay. Uh, one of the species is the ruddy-headed goose. Here yeah, I took a close-up just to show off the amazingly beautiful pattern. Okay. And here a picture of, of a pair of the goslings from the second trip. The goose in the back is the male, and in front of it is the female. They have four goslings, one is off the frame. Okay. Here, all four are present. The mother goose is showing them what to eat. Uh, little tiny green stuff in the sand. I don't know what they were eating, but they like that. Uh, okay. There's the male, a close up. Uh, he was always extremely alert uh, for predators because these little goslings are a nice little mouthful for some of them, but was also quite aggressive toward other members of his own species. If they came within 20, 30 yards, he would fly off and challenge them. And often they were pretty violent flashes up in the air and on the ground. I'm surprised they didn't get hurt. Pretty amazing. Okay. Um, the most numerous species of geese were the upland geese. Here, the male and female. You can see the female looks very similar to a ruddy head, but the pattern on its flanks is black and white and more widely spaced than on the ruddy head. Of course, the male looks very different. Okay. Very good. I was in Patagonia um, in, um, when was I there? November, I guess. Uh, and I noticed there that every pond in the lake had upland geese. Uh, so they're very widespread. Okay. There's a female upland goose flying by, giving me a chance to practice my flight shots. Uh, <laughs> uh, the third species of goose lives in a different environment in the intertidal zone on rocky beaches. Here, a picture taken in January 18 where the goslings are already a little bit bigger. Um, they go out on the rocks at low tide and feed on the plant material that is exposed, called the kelp goose for some reason. Um, okay. And then the last trip in early December, goslings were not quite that far along. You could see they were smaller. This picture was taken almost exactly in the same spot as the previous picture. The male kelp goose is up all white and easily spotted wherever it is. You know, it stands out against the dark rocks. Uh, the only color are the orange feet, and 
and I feel an anger. Um, walking along the beach, uh, uh, we'll chance into this little collection of uh, flightless steamer ducks that had uh, settled on the beach, snuggling with each other to stay warm in a wind that was probably 20 to 30 miles an hour. And uh, so looking quite content, as you can see. Uh, maybe it was, that's okay. And another duck, you can see she has a, a dark gray bill. Gave uh, the signal, they all stood up and lined up ducky style and walked into the surf without any hesitation. They were bobbing around in the waves like so many corks. And um, as with all geese and ducks, um, the parents don't feed their offspring. They just lead them to places where the offspring can find food. So this duck took them out in the surf and they ended up on some reef or exposed rocks out in the surf where they walked around and found apparently some delicious little bits. I don't know what they were eating, but probably some plant food, okay? Uh, talking about ducks, um, this is a yellow-billed teal that we found on several lakes. I think I photographed this in 2018 when there was more water on the islands. Um, in the, between my first trip and uh, last trip in 22, there had been a drought in the islands, and many of the ponds and lakes and islands dried up completely or substantially. And some birds had not yet returned to breed there. That, that would be beginning to. So, yellow billed teal, um, silvery, silver teal, or varsity colored teal, depending on who you talk to. And um, cheetah with vision. Hold up. And back on the beach, the Patagonian tufted duck. Beautiful red eyes, which seems to be common among diving birds. Um, and um, we saw it in, in several places. And again, also feeds among the rocks in the intertidal zone. Okay. Uh, talking about red eyes, uh, a grieb, a silvery grieb with its chick, uh, cruising around in one of the small lakes or ponds uh, in the island. And uh, a pond that uh, during our last trip was not productive for them because it was just beginning to fill again. They haven't returned yet to, to breathe. Okay. Um, too bad they're not quite as sharp as they should be <laughs> because of the projection. Um, see the the whole family, the male on the right would be diving constantly, uh, coming up with tiny bits that look like insect larvae probably, feeding the chick on the back of, of the mom who would sometimes shake it off, but it would climb back on. The second piece is our grief, uh, the white tufted grief uh, that we found both in our first trip and uh, Last year, uh, a cute little chick in a smallish um, lake on um, Bleaker Island, the last island we visited. There, there too, uh, the male on the right was diving very, very actively, pulling up food for the chick, which was already fairly big, and the female would shake it off repeatedly and at one point, it actually dove by itself, proving that it didn't really need to be fed anymore. But like some young people say these days, uh, they uh, prefer to be with mom and dad. Um, beautiful water. You can hear the red eyes of the diving bird. And basically, it's the iris that is red, and the pupil is just a little black point because when they're in in bright sunlight, they close down the eye pretty much. And when they dive, it obviously opens up uh, underwater. Um, this is a blackish oyster catcher that I photographed close to um, where the kelp keys were hanging out. Um, 
uh, during my first trip. I don't know if anybody got a picture of it in the second trip. I saw one flying by once, but they're much rarer than the Magellanic mm -hmm. uh, oyster catchers, which are literally everywhere. Okay. Another bird that uh, I was able to photograph is the snowy sheep bill that was walking around um, uh, among the elephant seals. And it looks like it has some sort of a disease, but it's actually the way they look in good health. Uh, and you can see that the gray or dark bill is coming out of the sheep, um, which maybe gets replaced. I don't know. But it doesn't make for the prettiest uh, look, at least from our point of view. Um, here, a giant a southern giant petrel. You can distinguish between the southern and northern. The northern ones are rare visitors, but the southern have this greenish tip of their bill. Um, this prime specimen was settled on the beach not far from an elephant seal that had an, a really gruesome wound on its back, either taken by an orca or hit by a propeller of a ship well, two feet wide and several inches deep, exposing fat and muscles, and I was sure it was going to die. And uh, whenever these birds, or kelp gulls, and skuas, uh, giant petrels, try to get closer to the meal, the seal would turn its head and they would back off. <laughs> um, interestingly, when I returned the next day to the very same spot, there was no wounded seal and had gone back to the ocean. And the researcher who was staying at the guest house also, researcher on elephant seals, said that they had a pretty good chance of surviving, even with a wound like that. I have a hard time believing that. It looked painful to me. Um, here, uh, a giant, a southern giant petrel on an unusual nest. Normally, the nest in the open in small colonies and are very sensitive to disturbance and sometimes abandon their nests. Um, this one is one of the rare individuals, not unheard of, that uh, nest by themselves among the tussock grass close to the beach. And this bird sat on the nest <coughs> two days when we walked by and was never, showed never any sign of stress or um, that it was about to leave. Well, it was very nice to see it. Great. Um, so Sea Lion Island, obviously called for some reason Sea Lion Island, but in actuality, there are way more elephant seals on the beaches of Sea Lion Island. Uh, there are really a lot of them. Uh, females, juniors, these are two junior males practicing fighting and uh, trying to get some scars of honor. <laughs> but we didn't see any um, really huge bulls that I've seen in photos from South Georgia Island with, you know, I don't know how many tons they weigh, but a number of tons. Um, you can see on the tail of this one and that on little yellow tags that were obviously placed there by, by the researcher um, in the method. Okay. And this was one of the more Senior looking, if not the most handsome looking, uh, uh, male who had taken it upon himself to lounge on another uh, elephant seal that was not particularly pleased because this guy probably weighed several tons too. Okay. Here, a female on the beach, on another beach, that had thrown with its flipper sands on top of herself in order to cool herself down so that her dark skin wouldn't absorb too much heat. Um, and uh, you can also see that these elephant seals molt by shedding their skin, not just their fur, but the entire skin which comes off in little pieces, not like a snake or a lizard that strips off the whole thing. Okay. You know, a typical, typical scene uh, on the beach, but plenty of elephant seals lounging, having a good time, and Magellanic penguins 
threading their way through them to back to their colony or down to the water. Um, as I was walking along the beach at one point, uh, I was being dive bombed by the South American terns that were screaming at me, flying straight at my face, and then veering off at the last moment, uh, letting me know that I was entering their breeding territory. And uh, so I stepped very gingerly among the plants. I didn't see any nests. Um, okay. There's a picture of one hovering above me. Beautiful birds. But I did find a, a nest of a Magellanic oyster catcher here. She, she was sitting at that point on one egg, which I discovered when I came the next day and she was gone. Um, just a depression in the sand, no nesting material, and um, protected from the wind to some extent by boulders around it. Um, other members of the group found other nests, so they were quite plentiful. Uh, here on the beach, uh, on Saunders Island, when the beach was exposed at low tide, oyster catchers would walk around casually, peck at the sand and pull out the crab. I don't know how they knew there was a crab underneath. It was not obvious to me. I looked at my binoculars as I walked and I couldn't see anything. And they just picked one crab after another and threw it on their backs and hollowed them out from the belly, which apparently must be softer. Okay. Yeah, the, the villains of the, of the islands, the Falkland Skuas, uh, that are very adept at pulling chicks from underneath penguins, especially when they're smaller, or pecking at unattended eggs of penguins um, and wreaking havoc wherever they can. Here in a mating display, uh, resulting in this, and then okay, resulting in that, although that's not the same bird. It didn't go that fast. Uh, it's another school that has found a very picturesque setting for its nest in these beautiful plants. After all, it was summer down there in the spring. Wow. Uh, Several islands had uh, imperial um, cormorants uh, nesting or roosting. And um, although I had photographed them on the trip in January earlier, uh, when I compared the pictures that I was able to take in December, there are much brighter colors in December. By January, the blue had faded to light blue, and the coronals had started to shrink down to not very impressive size. Um, so this is about their prime breeding display. Um, here are little squabble where you can see different stages. Always in the guy on the right in the foreground um, is probably the dominant one, I would say. Okay. A picture that shows um, all the wonderful photogenic colors that these guys bring to the table. Uh, the second kind of cormorant, the rock cormorant, uh, um, occurs also on the islands, but in much smaller numbers, and they require vertical cliffs to nest in, typically you know, what the locals call cracks, that is narrow inlets with two vertical walls. And um, I think they prefer those because they're too protects them from the wind that blows there all the time and sometimes quite strongly. Okay. Here's a picture of one of the nesting sites I like particularly the waterfall of the plastic grass there that you know, decided to sit on. Okay. Uh, for some reason, this sea lion island is called sea lion island because there are in fact some sea lions there, not nearly as many as Elephant seals. Now, this picture was taken in, in um, January when they had just given birth to pups. There were about 20 or so sea lions in one area, dominated by one big dominant male and a number of junior males around the periphery, uh, waiting for their chance, but no chance. And <laughs> it's tough on the males because they cannot leave 
to go feed in the ocean for several weeks. First, they herding up, uh, assembling up their harem. Then they have to guard them heavily against the com competing males. And once the females give birth, within two weeks, they mate already after birth. Um, so this poor guy first spends all his energy on her hurting the females, then he has to mate with all these ladies, and he looks really tired. You know? <laughs> He's sort of lying on the beach with the eyes closed and somewhat probably has lost quite a good percentage of his weight. Okay. Here's a, one of the junior males that trying to impersonate a real lion uh, oh. in the water. The female, female return from feeding in the ocean. Females are free to go, which is good because they have to feed the pups. Uh, and he rushed forward, and some of them must have noticed there is no longer an estrus and let her pass. Sila added, I want to say briefly something about this very special bird, the striated caracara, which occurs in several on sea lion island. Well, I don't think this house, there were always half a dozen juniors flying around. And I took this picture when I was huddling under a, a tussock grass clump during a violent hailstorm. And this guy flew in and settled down in the clump next to me and just looked in. He sat there and looked and looked, made no overture whatsoever. It was curious. Now, Darwin had already <coughs> commented on this, he called it the most remarkable creature, uh, which became the title of a book that was recently published by Jonathan Mayberg called The Most Rep uh, Remarkable Creature, which is about the natural history of Caracaras generally, but starting with this comment by Darwin and this particular species. Um, <clears throat> well, Darwin also reported that while they were anchored somewhere in the Falkland Islands, he visited the Falkland Islands twice in uh, 1833 and 1834 during the voyage of the Beagle. Um, and uh, these birds would, he told the fearless, come aboard and be among them. And at one point, just stole a hat and flew off with a hat. Well, we, at one point, walked down to the beach um, close to the guest house on Sea Lion Island, and um, Joanne was with us, and uh, Kathy, another woman, and her husband. And although we had been warned that there might be a slightly aggressive caracara nesting there, uh, I remember from my first trip that my friend Miles Tindall from uh, yeah, that I walked right next to a nest with the two parent birds sitting close by and they totally ignored us. So I didn't give it much heed. So once we got down to the beach, uh, Kathy and Joanne were going about taking pictures of this and that. And I saw the caracara leave the nest and swoop down to the beach, fly very low along the beach for about a hundred yards. And then swoop up behind Joanne and I called out, What's out, Joanne? Of course, she had no idea what I was talking about. And it grabbed her hat and flew up with it, <laughs> never to be seen again. So, on the one hand, she was very sorry to lose what she thought was a very nice woolen hat. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I think she felt slightly honored to be in the wake of Darwin here. <laughs> And uh, so this caracal flew, appeared at the nest again, and then attacked Joanne two more times, uh, thinking obviously that maybe it would lift off her hair because she has a nice little curly hairdo, and hit Kathy twice on the forehead. Yeah. And I think mostly with his feet balled up because there were no marks uh, of the talent. Mm -hmm. But hard enough that. He, yeah, they got a headache from this little Okay, thank you. Well, while they were going to a neighboring beach, I once again retreated to a, a clump of tussock grass to stay out of the wind and have my lunch. 
and I was looking to the left, watching these guys walk on the beach and photograph the little ducklings that I showed you earlier. And as I looked to the right, our friend was sitting about two feet from my shoe. <laughs> Just sitting there, I had flown in very silently and landed. And it looked at me just the way it had earlier, okay? And then after a little while, it looks off to the side because um, a pair of oyster catchers were starting to harass him because he obviously had a nest close by. And then it, it just spread its wing into the, into the wind and was lifted up and went off. Beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, other raptors in the island. Here you have a southern crested caracara, very similar to the ones you find well in America and South Texas. Uh, and uh, a hawk, it's called the variable hawk, or the locals called it russet back hawk. This is a female, only the female has a reddish back. Uh, when we were diving on Saunders Island, we saw her drag the remnants of a penguin carcass that it had scooped up somewhere into the <laughs> bushes in the middle of the uh, and we drove past, and that was it. We never saw that hawk again. Uh, the pair of them nested close to the settlement on Saunders in the cliffs above the you know, landing spot. Okay. And of course, our friend, the turkey vulture is present down there also. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very nice specimen. Um, the colors don't quite, quite right in the production. Um, but uh, I thought, uh, worth the picture. Um, also, not very shy. We're coming back from a hike to the western end of, of Saunders Island and found this guy. Well, I found it was maybe 15 feet away and he remained sitting there. Okay, after um, um, leaving Sea Island Island, we flew to Saunders Island, a large island of about 30,000 acres. Um, that on its western side has two high elevation, maybe five, 700 meters. <laughs> and in between, a land bridge uh, with beaches on either side, which is incredibly rich in wildlife, the kind of place that cruise ships go to and anchor and disgorge their zodiacs into these beaches. Up in the right hand corner, going out there, you see our pin can Hilton, <laughs> which is basically uh, looked like a converted shipping container, people holding eight yeah. people, with two double. Make a base on this side, two double make a bed on the other side, kitchen, media room, dining room, all this game room, all in a very small space. Uh, a bathroom here in the annex in the entrance. It was quite comfortable, actually. And uh, we were happy uh, on our first trip that this thing is tied down with strong steel cables, as you can see, because we had one violent storm that shook the whole building. And we would have probably be concerned about rolling down the hill. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, we did not. Okay. Um, so the first picture was from the um, South Beach. This is the North Beach. So basically, you have this rise that goes down like that. And everywhere you look on any rise, you see penguin colonies. The Magellanic. Um, Penguins go up the uh, slope in the back, and it's some of them very high, where they dig their burrows. And um, um, this is this picture is taken on high tide, so there's not much of a beach. Okay. Now uh, there's a small colony of king penguins, <laughs> uh, which, according to the rancher, has been growing in the last few years, which is nice. These guys have taken a thoughtful. Stroll in the afternoon. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
ground stuff around the area at the base of the bill. Here, the beach at low tide, you can see how broad the beach becomes. And uh, it becomes a playing ground, playground of the penguins that populated uh, almost constantly when the tide is out. You can see from the breaking waves how the wind is blowing off the top uh, because that's the very strong wind. Okay. Here's one of my favorite pictures from the first trip where uh, the tide is now completely out, but substantially out. And in late afternoon light, just before the sun dips behind the rise of the, um, of the neck, as they call it, you have these hundreds of penguins spread all the way into the distance as you see in little dots. And you see there are some of the columns on the left. It was a pretty magical moment to see that. No, nobody there but me and a few friends. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't know really many places in the world where you can have that kind of experience of richness of wildlife, uh, wildlife that's not afraid of you, and at the same time, um, extreme emptiness as far as people are concerned. That's why I went there twice. <laughs> I we went to the same places uh, each time. Okay. Um, so the beach is over there. Our little tin can hotel. Uh, we hiked up on the slope, and the first thing we encounter is a large black browed albatross colony. Uh, birds that build their nest out of mud and grass, and they like to be where there's a seep, so that there's mud available for that. Um, okay. And this is a, uh, in a different location. As you can see here, the nest uh, often looks like a, a result of pottery. Okay. Here, there, the, uh, this is during our last trip. The bird and back have just returned from feeding in the ocean and was trying to take over an incubation from, from the bird sitting on the on the nest. She needed a lot of nudging to, to give up her spot. They have only one egg always. And in my well, ultimately he took he or she took over. Okay. There you have a good picture of the pottery style of building nests. There's this column of mud and grass with a small indentation on top, typically without lining. Here, a bird is sitting on the, on the nest, and I was able to take a close-up picture of, of the patterns of his feathers and the black Wow, it's kind of amazing how individual tiny feathers can produce that kind of coherent effect. Okay. Yeah, during our first day, one of the members of the uh, group, of only five people plus our leader, because of the cancellation, sitting here among um, the albatross, they yeah. absolutely no attention to you. you can, actually lift up the chick and nothing would happen. Um, greeting uh, rituals among the, the albatross are legendary, as you may have seen in videos or National Geographic uh, films. They rub their bill, they clap their bells, they spread their tail, they open their gate, and the other person looks and that bird goes into it, and then it opens its gate wide, you know, like at the dentist. And it's a ritual that can go on for quite some time. Uh, they are very tightly bonded. This picture was taken during the first trip, which you can tell by the fact that there are chips all over the place. Whereas during the December trip, most birds were still sitting on eggs. And I think when you went with the Rancher to the place north of the settlement, you found one hatched um, um, 
bird, which he had predicted. He knew exactly the day when the first ship would appear, and it would be right on time. Okay? <clears throat> and there are picture of the albatross and Clyde with enormous wings, uh, fairly narrow, um, suited to uh, um, keep it aloft in the ocean for days on end. Um, Sorry, no. Are trying to rush me? <laughs> uh, yeah, the picture is still of the ginger penguins close to our Tin Can Hotel uh, that have just come in. Um, here they're just emerging out of the ocean and, and uh, line up on this rock and keep jousting each other and shaking and trying to um, drop up a little bit. Here uh, a couple walking on the beach. Uh, I said in my Facebook page, they look like a retired couple posing for an ad of AARP. <laughs> a couple that have saved children before they retire and now, you know, take a vacation on the beach, carefree and glad that they did what they did. <laughs> but in reality, these are two independent penguins. I won't know one. Be too cynical, uh, but they just came back from feeding and they're heading back to the chicks you know, to feed them. Like this little fellow uh, was actually a chick that was fairly um, precocious, it was taken in December. Um, and again, there's only one chick, which suggests the other one was stolen. and. You know, so everyone profited from that and became quite substantial, as you can see. <laughs> um, now, the darlings of most people who go penguin watching, besides, of course, everybody wants to see the king penguins, are the rock hall of penguins. They're only about this tall, uh, incredibly cute, a very photogenic, very curious, fearless, um, they just look at you sideways like that, displaying their various hairdos. Okay. Now they do some power cleaning. So when they approach their landing spot, on a rocky beach, they often can see them in the wave surfing, not only on top of the wave, like this fellow there, but inside the wave, shooting towards the beach. Okay. Okay, that, can, can we play the video? Do you know how to do it? Oh, is this the video? Yeah. Uh, we, we have to look there. I'm afraid to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Maybe that should be a little mark on there, but if not, we just take my word for it. Uh, and when, yeah. um, we don't really have that much time. Um, when they come out of the water, this is at low tide. You know, the beach is very long. They're very eager to form groups because they feel quite vulnerable. You know, sometimes giant petrels will attack rock or penguins and kill them. Uh, <laughs> So they just bunch up and keep hopping and walking, kind of cute in that video, but you can't play it for some reason. My God. And land at high tide, you know, the waves crash into the rocks, and you feel that these poor little birds get smashed to pieces, but it doesn't bother them at all. They get thrown against the rock and jump out and look completely unscathed. Um, and uh, unfazed. And then in another location, uh, on some of the other, we could look down on a very violent ocean. They were just in a mall stream of waves sinking and coming up. No problem. They would find the waves that would get them onto the rocks, and something get washed off again repeatedly, but they're used to it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Again, these are all videos. Uh, when they come up onto the rocks, they are tight pools. And curiously, although they just come straight out of the ocean, they feel the need to bathe. 
they go in there and splash around, roll around, shake, and uh, okay, and then proceed to head up to the colony. This is also a video, unfortunately, not playable. Uh, but you can see that they have traditional pathways to go up because as you look at the rocks on the right, they're dark and rough. And look above, they're completely smooth and white, worn down by the feet of these rock covered penguins over the centuries. You know, they have been probably using that spot for a very long time. And then they go up, and it would be fun to see, maybe you have seen it on National Geographic movies or whatever, the way they hop up without losing their balance, without using their wings, is pretty amazing. Um, okay, one more little portrait. Um, okay, now uh, here, one exulting over something, standing next to its female and, it, and her chick, or their chick, um, we're quite vocal at times, and that's how they uh, demonstrate it. And then, just for size comparison, one member of our group, Tina, had sat down on the rocks to photograph the colony that's just to the right of us, which had a macaroni penguin in it, which are kind of rare on the other. They're only about between 100 and 300 for that rate. And we have only always found one mixed in with the rock of the penguin, sometimes the hybridized. So this fellow came out of the colony and hopped on her leg, checked out her repair job on the uh, lens hood, then proceeded to nibble on her iPhone, then checked out the, the, the buckles on her boot, then he jumped on the tip of her boot, stretched out like this, shook his head, and jumped off. And, seemed quite content about what it had learned. <laughs> quite wonderful and obviously a, a peak experience for Tina. I had an experience close to that, but not quite as a center. In the previous trip, I was sitting on a rock shelf photographing imperial cormorants, and all of a sudden I saw this single rock of the penguin hopping along up on the rock down and coming towards me, and there was only that much space up in front of my feet. So it came up and looked at me, and pretty much jumped on my shoe and continued <laughs> its way. Now I could, could have touched it if uh, that were forbidden. Okay. So, so this is a macaroni uh, penguin, uh, <laughs> obviously bigger than his girlfriend uh, next to him, which is a rock over. Penguin. And here is a beautiful job, very beautiful um, crest that uh, originated right above the bill while the, the rock hoppers have it on the side. Uh, very quickly, at one, one point when Joanne and I and uh, a couple of other people hiked to the west end of the island, a pretty long hike, about seven miles round trip, we saw some commerce and uh, dolphins below us, frolicking in, in the scene about maybe 10 of them surfing in very shallow waves, almost to the point that they were stranding themselves and then flipping around and going back and doing it again, obviously having a good time. Um, okay, so as we were hiking along sheep trails to get to the west end, uh, and sort of condensing it. Uh, to land, photograph a couple of long tailed metal large. I photographed this guy during my first trip and I had called the Mount Stimble. Okay. Uh, a dark faced round tyrant, which is really pretty awful name uh, for a flycatcher. And along the way, we uh, uh, could watch seagulls. This one, is the brown headed gull, one of three species that exist in the island? Um, okay. uh, a dolphin gull, and oh, here. Oh, okay. Sorry. And the kelp gull that we had already seen on the beach in Volunteer Point. Okay, and as we came to the end of our hike, 
uh, near the end of the island, there is a large wetland area on the lake. And all the, the ranch I told us that we didn't think that this year there were any black neck swans. We were tickled pink, Joanne and I at least, uh, to see them. And all, they're quite shy and started moving away, but we were able to get a shot before they were too far away. So that was kind of neat. Okay. Uh, so, jumping ahead to our last island, uh, Bleaker Island, I'm just going to focus on the passerine birds that hung around the really luxurious guest house they had built. Uh, it could look very well be in Sea Ranch or wherever. Uh, quite wonderful, but they still had sheep. Uh, here are Falkland Thrush, uh, a bridal finch. Which was still called Black Chin Pinch during my first trip, but they changed names quite uh, quickly. And then, uh, another green bag sitting on flowering horse. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a grass wren, very difficult to photograph because they're just in the grass, you know, flying very short distance in the whirring, little flight, and nothing ever sits still. So that's the best I can do. And here, the Cobb's wren, which is the southern version of the house, or house wren, um, that lives mostly among the boulders on the beach. This one was photographed on the sea line. And the black chin, siskin, all the passerine birds in the Falklands fit on one page in the bird. <laughs> um, here again, our friend, the uh, long tail of uh, the male, and uh, here, a picture of the female on Saunders Island with some juicy bits for her chicks. Uh, no Germanic snipe and beautiful grassland on um, Creeker Island. A two banded clover huddling behind the flowers of sea cabbage, a great plant that grows everywhere on the beach. And this was flowering in December. Um, very quickly, I know we run out of time. Um, the gentoo penguin, um, porpoising, which is very common in them, and actually many of the uh, penguins, especially when they approach the landing spots, they come shooting out of the water like porpoises. Um, and um, there's a beach on Big Island that. We went to on our first trip where these gentle penguins returned from feeding in the ocean in the afternoon. We'd sit on the beach and they would come at fairly high speed underwater shooting for the beach. And at the very last moment, we'd shoot up straight up and try to nail an, up, an upright landing. <laughs> and we would give them points like a gymnastics competition. There were quite a few 10 pointers here. Yeah. And, uh, so you had to shoot at a pretty good shutter speed on 2,000 or 2,500 a second to catch them that, uh, that scene. And it was not always easy because you wouldn't know where they would crop out. So there were lost a lot of missed shots too. Okay. And, um, well, that, that one was clearly a 10. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't go to land in Delhi and then say, I meant to do that. And <laughs> once they have landed, they typically stand there for a second, they run a few steps, and then they stand there looking around and they say, Where exactly am I? <laughs> and then they start their trek to the calling about half a mile away, up, um, very shallow hill. Well, we tried to do that during our second trip, but somehow the gentle penguins didn't get the message or they changed their ways. There was a bit there in the colony that would get there and a few of them, few of the gentles would come and perform for people who didn't hadn't been there on the first trip, right, Joanne? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but after a while, there was an overwhelming number of, of Magellanic penguins that had shown up there as if they were waiting 
for the arrival of a rock star or what, or maybe me, you know. And it was impossible to uh, get pictures of their gentrus. And Ed, a member of our group, was sitting there, he just put his camera down and took in the admiration of all his fans around him, <laughs> which was the, the last picture. Because the next morning we took off and went back to San Diego, back to Punta Arena, Rio Gallegos, and then to Punta Arenas, and then to Santiago, to Dallas, to Sacramento. And uh, anyway, that's the end of the show. I had to rush a little bit because uh, we we're running out of time. Good thing we didn't watch those movies. <laughs> Thank you, Manfred. <laughs> I would love to go back there again. It's really a, a wonderful experience to be just in that environment. And I would see the same birds and same animals over again because there's not such a huge variety. It's not like going to Colombia twice. You're guaranteed to see new birds because they have over 2,000 species recorded in that country. The bird book on the apartment is about this big. <laughs> Any it's, it's, questions for Manfred? We have a few minutes. What was the temperature like there? Pretty the temperature. Temperature? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't particularly cold, probably in the 50s, maybe in the morning in the 40s. The Falkland Islands are only as far south towards the South Pole as well as is towards the North Pole. Uh, but the environment is very different. There's no Gulf Stream there that keeps things a little warmer, and instead you have the Antarctic flow uh, of cold wind, which also explains why there are no indigenous population in the islands before the Europeans arrived there. Uh, because even if by chance some people came over by canoe from Tierra del Fuego, they could not have subsisted there. They could not have built New, new boats or build huts. They could have subsisted for one generation on penguins and eggs and chicks and all that, but no firewood and, and so on. Yes. Fred? Fred. Uh, Amanda, when uh, Gene Trapp and I were there in Pocatan, the area around Stanley was loaded with landmines. Oh. The, many of the beaches were closed following the, the war. The Argentinians were unwilling to give them maps of the minefields. So that's still the case. No, you weren't told by anybody to watch on the internet. Or... Maybe someone asked Stan, but that's it. That's it. Well, that was in 2010, you said? Yes. Yeah, so this was eight and uh, 13 years later. Uh, they have done a lot of clearance. Uh, feelings are still very hard about the war of uh, uh, 1982. They, they hate the Argentinians. Yeah, I know. The Argentines are not particularly fond of the, yeah, of the yeah. threats either, <laughs> which explains why, in order to get there, you can't fly through Buenos Aires or Rio Gallegos, which is like 300 miles away, uh, but have to go to Chile uh, and fly down on the west coast and then cut over at Tierra del Fuego. To get to uh, the islands, I don't think they can even fly over over Argentine ter territory to get there. On the return flight, in both cases, we stopped over in Rio Gallegos in Argentina because they have an agreement that once a month, uh, out of the four flights per month, they have to stop there mostly to unload uh, workers from Argentina that work in. In the Falkland Islands, yeah, for major major uh, medical care, they were having to fly over Argentina, Chile, uh -huh. to care. Yeah, it's uh, in almost everything people need on the Falkland Islands. They have no natural resources except wind. You know, they have more and more windmills there. Uh, every settlement, every farm has a windmill that charges their batteries. Um, um, since they have no resources, everything has to be imported. Food, 
there's a supermarket in Stanley, which is quite well stocked. It's amazing. Uh, we can find everything there. I think once a month they get a shipload of supplies from Montevideo in Uruguay um, and uh, or some supplies from England. There's one weekly flight off of England, but it's a military flight and flies from England to Ascension Islands to refuel and then on to um, Falkland Islands. And you can fly with them if there's space available. And I hear it's quite expensive. If you want to learn any more about groceries, stick around and talk to Manfred. And thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Amber, do we want you to know that folks on Zoom were saying thank you, great presentation, thanks for sharing. <laughs> I'm glad you got it mostly working. Yeah. Do it work for the Zoom people? Yes. Yeah.